Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting us into your space today. We've got a lot of things going on at Christ Community and we'd love for you to get connected. So head on over to our website and look at our coming up page so you can see all the different things going on. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can see whenever new content's available. Enjoy the message. We're in the midst of a teaching series where we're walking through kind of verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians, which is a letter the apostle Paul wrote 2,000 plus years ago to a recently established church in the city of Corinth. And Corinth was a multicultural, consumeristic, sexually promiscuous city. In many ways, it was similar to uh, the cultural context that we live in. And so in this letter, Paul is addressing a number of issues that were going on in that church in terms of relational division and pride and sexual immorality. Well, in chapter 7, Paul begins to address some of the questions that this church had sent to him in a previous letter, and they're asking about these specific things. And one of those had to do with sex in marriage, and we looked at that last week. And in the midst of answering that question, Paul begins to address another topic, another group of people within the Corinthian church. And this group of people were singles, people who were not married. Paul spends quite a bit of time in this chapter talking about singleness. In America today, 40% of people over the age of 18 are single, 40%. This is a huge segment of our society and our church. So this passage here, it speaks to those who want to be married. It speaks to those who don't desire marriage. It speaks to those who are widowed. It speaks to those who are divorced. And it also speaks to those of us who are married and have single friends in our lives that we are journeying with. Singleness is very significant and relevant to all of us. So Paul, in this passage, focuses on singleness. Now, what's fascinating is how Paul's perspective on singleness is very different than the perspective found in most churches today. When I, when I graduated a number of years ago from K-State, um, I initially thought I wanted to be a a math teacher, so I taught math at a high school for a couple of years, and then I prayerfully decided to, to go to seminary and really explore this desire in my heart to perhaps be a pastor one day. So I moved to Chicago, started a master's program for pastoral ministry. I was 25 years old at the time. I was single at the time and, and not dating anyone. And I remember often thinking, what would happen if I were to graduate in three years and still be single? Would any church be interested in me as their pastor? And I knew the answer to that question, no. Maybe as a youth pastor, but not as a senior pastor. There, there was this unspoken understanding in the church world that there was something wrong with an unmarried senior pastor, maybe in terms of maturity or credibility or in terms of temptation or whatever. Being single was not viewed as being a positive thing, which was really frustrating and, and hurtful for me. Now, I wish I could say that that attitude was limited only to church pastoral search committees, uh, but it's not. In, in many, if not most churches in America, being single is not viewed as something to be celebrated, honored, Encourage. No, quite the contrary. Singleness is often viewed as being something negative, an unfortunate absence of something that hopefully one day will be fixed with marriage. But until then, so the narrative goes, you must remain in your misery. Um, I mean, this is unfortunately the unspoken and at times spoken message communicated in many, if not most churches. I was talking with a single friend of mine who told me how hurtful it is when people in the church say things like, why aren't you married? Don't you want to be? I mean, questions like that imply that, that, that a single person is less than and is missing something crucial. Often in Christian circles, there's this idea that marriage is the ideal and singleness is less than. After all, isn't that what the Bible says? You know, God said to Adam, it is not good to be alone. So he created Eve and, and established marriage. And that's that, right? Marriage is the ideal and singleness is not. Well, into that seemingly smooth, supposed biblical narrative, the Apostle Paul kind of cannonballs himself. Uh, and man, does he create some waves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul offers a very different perspective on singleness. Here, here's how I would summarize it. Marriage is good, 
but singleness is better. We see this right away in verse six. Paul's just been talking about the importance of sexual intimacy in marriage. Don't deprive each other of that. And then he says, I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul is saying, look, all this talk about men and women needing to get married, that's a concession. It's not a command. Paul's saying, I'm not commanding anyone to get married. In fact, Paul says, I wish that all of you were as I am. In other words, I wish everyone was single like me. Paul celebrated his own singleness. He valued it. And he encouraged others to value it. Again, it's not that he thought marriage was bad. He just thought singleness was better. Now, before we talk about why Paul thought singleness was better, I want to clarify something. When Paul is talking about singleness, he is not talking about sexually active singleness. He's talking about singles who are following Jesus in their sexuality by remaining celibate. As we saw a few weeks ago in chapter six, Paul made it very clear that any sexual engagement outside of marriage is outside of God's will. Now look, I realize in this age of tender and hookups and swiping left and right, this idea of sex being reserved for marriage feels archaic, but it's not. As we've talked about in detail over the past few weeks, this is about our wholeness. This is about the purpose for which sex was originally designed by God, this physical and spiritual uniting of a man and a woman who have committed themselves to each other for life and are now now completely vulnerable with each other. I mean, sex is this powerful, beautiful uniting of a husband and wife in self-giving love. So any engagement in sex outside of that protective boundary is a rejection of God's loving purpose for our sexuality. And as KJ talked about two weeks ago, it's a, it's a rebellion against our own body. It's to sin against our own body. So when Paul is talking about singleness, he's talking about a single person who is aligning their lives with God's will for their sexuality. Now, is this easy to do in our sexualized culture? No, it is not easy. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about that a little later here, but, but, but we're also gonna see there is something uniquely powerful in these choices to honor God with our bodies in terms of our intimacy with him. Now, let me also point out how Paul's perspective totally exposes the lie in our culture that if you haven't had sex, you haven't really lived. Jesus was the most complete, whole human being that ever lived on this planet. He never had sex Does that make him less whole, less mature, less helpful? Of course not. By any biblical measure, sex is not an indicator of maturity or human thriving. Okay, so with that foundation, I want us to look at two specific reasons Paul gives for uniquely valuing singleness. The first has to do with troubles. Troubles. If we jump down to verse 25, where he picks up this theme again, To those who are unmarried, specifically in this case, virgins, people who have never been married, here's what he says. Because of the present crisis, I think that it's good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you've not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she's not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. See, notice again how Paul is walking this fine line. He's not saying marriage is bad. He's not. Or that getting married is a sin. No, but he is saying that from his perspective, singleness is better. So he's recommending that people remain single. And the reason he's recommending this has to do with troubles. 
He refers in verse 26 to some present crisis. We don't know exactly what Paul was referring to when he talks about the present crisis. It could have been something happening in Corinth. It could have been something happening in society in general, um, seeing you know, where people were headed in the culture or where things were headed in the culture or whatever. But Paul sees this present crisis through the lens of singleness. The advantages of being single in the midst of difficulties. Look again at verse 28. Those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. See, from Paul's perspective, being married adds complexity to life, and it increases the likelihood of troubles. This this word trouble can also be translated pressure, stress, challenges. See, anytime you bring two sinful people together in a marital union, it increases the likelihood of challenges, of conflicts, of hurts, of personality differences and different ideas about how we should spend our money and the challenge of being married to someone who doesn't share your interests or who doesn't share your love for Jesus, the challenge of being married to someone who is now facing a disability and needs constant care, or what about the unique challenges of children and parenting, of miscarriages, of children with special needs, or the excruciating pain of adult children who walk away from the faith or take their own life. Again, Paul is not saying that a single person doesn't have any troubles. He's saying that being married adds to the list of possible troubles that could happen. So in preparing for this message, I I read an excellent book by a guy named um, Sam Albury, who's a single pastor um, in England. And and this book is called The Seven Myths About Singleness. And in the book, he acknowledges that both singleness and marriage have their particular ups and downs. But the temptation for many who are single is to compare the downs of singleness with the ups of marriage. And to have this idealized view of marriage that isn't accurate. So he writes this. Paul's point, he's talking about 1 Corinthians 7, is to show singles that there are some downs that are unique to marriage. Some worldly troubles that we are spared by the virtue of our singleness. And then he says this. Seeing what I have seen in the last decade or so as a pastor and walking with families and all that stuff. I would have to say, I would choose the lows of singleness over the lows of marriage any day of the week. And then he says, I think being unhappily married must be so much harder than being unhappily single. See, that's that's a helpful perspective that I think gets at the heart of what Paul is saying here. Paul then goes on to describe a second value of being single, and this has to do with focus. So what we're focusing on, look at what he says next, verse 29. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. There is a ton in that in these words that I don't have time to look at, but if you have a small group, man, dive in there because there is some really interesting things Paul's saying there. But let me summarize. Paul's talking about the importance of living with eternity in mind because this world is passing away. So he's urging us to not view our present emotions or circumstances, or Amazon purchases as permanent things. Our grief, our happiness, our marital status, all these things are passing away. Paul wants to remind us of where our focus is to be on eternity. So then he applies this to being single. Verse 32, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, 
but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. See, what Paul is saying here has to do with focus. A married person's focus is on their spouse, how to please their spouse. And that's not a bad thing. It's, it, it, it's the way marriage is designed. And there are lots of blessings that come from that in terms of learning how to love and how to die to self and all those things. But, Paul says, a person who is single doesn't have that divided interest that divided focus. So they can focus more fully on Jesus and his kingdom. They can focus more fully on ministering to him and for him. See, Paul sees this as a huge blessing and an opportunity for someone who is single. And I, look, I really want everyone who is single to truly hear what Paul is saying because it has the power to change your attitude and your perspective about your circumstances. And I want to specifically speak for a moment to those who are single and don't want to be. You long to be married. All your friends are married. You feel like you're missing out. You perhaps feel less than or whatever. Again, I want you to hear what Paul might be saying to you. The desire to be married is not wrong. It is not wrong to want to be married someday. But there are two ways to long to be married. One is to make this your constant obsession and to ride this roller coaster of emotions, depending on how many likes and matches you're getting from your hinge profile. You check it multiple times a day. You fantasize about being married. You spend hours watching Hallmark movies and comparing your life to that and feeling depressed about what you don't have. See, this particular heart posture fuels discontent and dissatisfaction because it's focused on what you don't have. That's one way to be single and long to be married. But Paul presents a very powerful alternative to living that way. It is to leverage this season in your life, to more fully focus your heart and your body on your devotion to Jesus, to loving him, to pleasing him, to making your relationship with him your priority. I love how Paul words this. Look again, verse 34. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. That is so powerful. He's describing a single person who is not denying their desire to one day be married, but rather than cultivating this discontent and all the unhealthy places that can go, this person is leveraging their singleness to focus wholeheartedly on their relationship with Jesus and giving themselves in ministry for him. This is all about where our heart is focused. In preparation for this message, I had two different um, single friends read through my manuscript and offer input, and both of them talked in detail about how in their singleness, they've been able to trust Jesus more deeply and to learn how to hear his voice more clearly, trusting Jesus with their longings and their disappointments and their fears. One specifically mentioned how the older she gets, the easier it is to start doubting God and to shut her heart down and become bitter towards God. I, I love what she, she wrote. She, she wrote, I think as single people get older, they can either harden their hearts and become bitter, or they can learn to cultivate that intimacy with Jesus, be authentic and keep their hearts soft, even in the seasons of pain, disappointment, discouragement, etc. She talked about how in this season, God has been, and I love this word, has been cementing in her heart his truth. I love that. I mean, being single provides a unique opportunity to focus on and lean into your relationship with Jesus going deeper in intimacy with him. Now, now, please hear me. I'm not saying it's wrong to do hinge or Christian mingle or whatever. If you feel led to do that, if, if you want to be married, it makes sense to be around people in similar circumstances. But the crucial issue is your heart posture. Are you desperately seeking to be married and so focused on that that it occupies a central place in your heart? Or are you seizing this opportunity to pursue Jesus more wholeheartedly? Are you leveraging this time in your life for his kingdom? You know, I want to go back to a word Paul used earlier in this passage to describe his being single. Verse 7, I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, 
Another has that. Now, sometimes people read this verse and assume that Paul's talking about singleness being like the superpower. To be able to live as a single person requires a supernatural strength and gifting because it is so difficult to do so. And if, if you're single, but you long to be married, well, you must not have the gift. But I'm not sure that's what Paul's saying here. The word Paul uses for gift here is the same word he will use in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when talking about spiritual gifts. Same word. Spiritual gifts are not superpowers that enable us to endure something. No, spiritual gifts are impartations given by God to be used to build up the body. And I also think they're often temporary. Spiritual gifts are not necessarily permanent, but they are given for a season. So think about how this might apply to being single. For those of you who are single, what if you viewed your singleness as a spiritual gift to be used to bless others? That in this season, you are perhaps able to do things or minister to people in ways that you couldn't if you were married going on mission trips or, or learning some new language or doing some ministry that requires significant time commitment. I mean, it's a blessing. It is an op- a unique opportunity. It may not be where you want to be. It, it may not be where you want to be in five years, but it's where you are today. So why not leverage that gift? As my single friend says, say yes to every adventure God puts before you in your singleness. You won't regret it. I mean, Paul's a great example of this. His singleness enabled him the freedom to do amazing things for God, planning churches and working out deep theological issues and writing a good portion of the New Testament. Paul's singleness is still impacting all of us today. Thank God Paul was single so that he could have the kingdom impact that he did. Now, look, I don't want to use Paul's words here to paint this idealized picture of singleness. I mean, clearly it does have some benefits, as Paul describes, but it is not without challenges. One of the challenges of singleness, as Paul alludes to in this passage, is the challenge of having sexual desires and not having a context in which to express those desires. And then throw in the mix the reality of living in a sexualized culture with such easy access to porn, to casual hookups, etc. Being single in a society like ours is not easy, but it is also not impossible. Our sexual desires can be continually surrendered to the Lord and also point our hearts toward our ultimate longing for intimacy with him. In in chapter six, Paul says something so profound, so powerful. He's talking about why to avoid sexual immorality with a prostitute. And then he says this, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. I mean, here's Paul as a single guy talking about a level of intimacy and passion for God that is even deeper than physical intimacy. Look, our physical, excuse me, our sexual desires are not ultimate things. They're not. They point to a deeper longing for union with Jesus. Even as a married person, for those married folks here, even as a married person, this is really important truth for us to realize. Our physical intimacy with our spouse is temporary. Jesus made it clear that there won't be marriage in heaven Our sexual desires, whether we're single or married, ultimately point to a deeper longing for union with God. That's what we were created for. Now, obviously, this doesn't take away our sexual desire, but it does help reframe it. What what if rather than focusing on, on just denying, trying to deny or ignore our sexual desire, what if we instead used it and we let it fuel our intimacy and longing for Jesus In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about this thorn in his flesh. We don't know what it was, but it was something that really frustrated him, was buffeting him, and he asked God three times, he asked God to take it away. But God said no. And in that place of struggle, God said this to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. See, what if we viewed our weaknesses, our struggles, our unmet sexual desires, our difficulties in life, what if we viewed those things as an opportunity to lean on Jesus more fully and experience his presence and power in a greater way? Now, in addition to this area of unmet sexual desire, one of the other challenges of singleness is loneliness, 
coming home to an apartment without anyone to greet you. To a single person, friendship and community are critical things, critically important. Now, one of the advantages of being single is that you potentially have more availability to pursue relational connections and community. A married friend of mine with young children recently mentioned to me how at times he is jealous of those who are single because of the flexibility and availability to spontaneously you know, do things with other people at 10 o'clock at night or whatever. But there is a downside to this as a single person. I mean, married people sort of have a built-in relational connection that's always there. But a single person doesn't automatically have that. In Sam Alberry's book, he writes, and again, this is important for all of us, married and singles, to, to hear what he's saying. He says, even when friendship is maintained with a married friend, it often becomes lopsided. The married friend no longer needs you as much as he or she did, which means that I, as the single person, usually have to take most of the initiative in the friendship. I have to reach out to my married friends if we're going to get together. And then he says this, as a single person, my friends are a lifeline. They're like family. They're the ones with whom I feel most known and loved. I need them hugely. Look, when I read this, it opened my eyes to the reality of why us being a church family is so important. We need each other. We all need relationships. We all need hugs, right, and friendships and encouragement and community. That Those of us who are married need to make sure that our circle of relationships includes those who are single and that we're initiating relational connections with them and inviting them into our lives. And those of us who are single, please know that you are valued. You are a vital part of this church family. We see you and love you. We need you. All of us have been made a family through the blood of Jesus. And as a blood-bought family, everyone in this family matters. Everyone is valuable and seen and important. Amen. Well, let's stand. In just a moment, I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. This ancient prayer, come Holy Spirit. And all we're doing in that is we're opening our hearts to be present to the Lord afresh, in a fresh way, in whatever he would want to say to us or want to do in us. And if you're comfortable, I encourage you to have your palms open. This too is an ancient posture of prayer, of receptivity to the Lord. So Holy Spirit, come. We open our hearts and our minds and our bodies to you. Come, Holy Spirit. as we're waiting on the Holy Spirit and opening our hearts to him. I, I have a, just a, a, a scripture that has been on my heart for the last hour or so, just praying into this service. It's from Genesis 16. It's this passage where a single mom, basically Hagar, is kicked out of Abraham's family. And so she's a, she's a single mom. She's fleeing with her child and, and she has an encounter with the Lord and, and she says to God, you are the God who sees. And this is not my heart. I, I feel like the Lord may want those who are single, just he may want you to be reminded afresh that he sees you and he's walking with you. He loves you. He sees you. 
So God, I pray for anyone who needs to hear that, just that reminder that you are with them and that you see them and that you love them. God, we open our hearts to all that you want to do in us, singles or married. We open our hearts to you. Now, in just a moment, the worship team's gonna come and begin to lead some worship. And we wanna really create a ministry opportunity for a couple of things. One, if you feel like the Lord, the Holy Spirit is doing something in you, feel free to remain at your seat. That's totally cool. But we also invite you to come forward and just to come up into any area up here and as you stand here receiving from the Lord, we'll, we have prayer team members and they would love to come alongside you. They're not gonna ask you what's going on. They're just gonna place a hand on your shoulder and, and just bless what God's doing. And if they sense something from the Lord, they'll just share that with you and pray into that. So I encourage you, invite you anytime during worship to come forward for that. But I also want to invite you to the table, the Lord's table which represents the, the, it has the bread representing Jesus' body and the juice representing his blood. And as we come to a table, I want to invite you to be reminded that Jesus is at the center of everything, that he is at the center of our lives. He is our first love, not our marriage, not our relationships, not our, he is our first love, he gave his all for us. He gave his life for us. And so as you come to a table and partake of the bread and the juice, I want to, I want to encourage you to open your heart afresh to this truth that Jesus is at the center of your life. He is at the center of your heart. The other thing I want you to remember about the table is that we do it together as a family. We do the Lord's Supper together as a family because at this table, it represents Jesus' blood that has made us a family in him. And so I want to remind us of that. And I was just reading um, earlier this week, Jesus says something so fascinating. Matthew 19, after he distributes the elements, bread, and gives thanks for that, and then the, the wine to his disciples, he then says, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus is waiting to enjoy his next glass of wine. He's waiting until we are all together at the banquet in his father's house. <laughs> this is all about family, about being a blood-bought family, purchased with the blood of Jesus. And so as we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's do so as a family, remembering that we, every one of us matters. Every one of us is seen and is valuable and belongs to this family. So God, thank you for this table. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for us. We love you for that. We offer ourselves to you completely. And we thank you for the gift you've given of your very life. As we partake in a moment, I pray that Holy Spirit, you would stir in us this reminder that you are the center of our lives and that we are a part of a family because of you. And there may also be here or watching someone who has never opened their heart to you. They've never placed their trust in you. So if that's you out there or you're here, I just want to encourage you and remind you, having a relationship with Jesus is not about being Good is not about going to church. It's not about trying to be a good person. It's about receiving what Jesus has done for you. It's about receiving his forgiveness and placing his trust in his finished work on the cross. When you do that, his spirit comes to live in you. And so I want to invite you, even now in this moment, to open your heart to him. Just say yes 
to Jesus. Jesus, I trust you, I love you, I open my heart to you and I receive the forgiveness that you offer. Come live in me through the presence of your spirit. So God, I pray for anyone who prayed that prayer, I pray you would bless them and help them grow in their relationship with you. Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Lord. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this service. You know, sometimes when you, you hear a message like this, there are some things that stir up in your heart and in your life because maybe it's applying to you or maybe you're at a place where there's something else going on and you're just thinking to yourself, I could really use somebody to talk to. Uh, we want to let you know that if you head over to our website, which is cccgreeley.org, uh, there's a little button that says chat with us at the bottom. And if you click that, uh, literally within minutes, mm -hmm. one of our pastors will be reaching back out to you. Uh, and we would love to just be able to journey with you if there's something going on or maybe there's something you just want to celebrate. Uh, so we invite you, please head over there um, if there's something going on. Other than that, we hope you have a fantastic week.